Hi, thank you for clicking on this video. My name is Sean and I spent the past month making a botnet in Minecraft. This is what it can do. You may have come across a mod called ComputerCraft, or rather its successor, ComputerCraft Tweaked. This mod lets you craft uh, so-called turtles. I like to think of these turtles as robots. They can perform the following actions. Move forward, up or down. Turn left or right. Dig forward, up and down. Place forward, up and down. And other actions such as sucking up items from the same directions. These turtles are programmed using Lua. Lua is an interesting language. I prefer to stay away from it for any larger projects. The vision of having multiple turtles running the same program, building and destroying blocks have been seeded, however. I'm not comfortable enough with Lua to make this happen, but luckily I've been learning Rust over the past year and a half. Here is the general idea. There are multiple turtles in the world. There is a Rust program running a web server. The turtle starts a Lua program, registers with the Rust web server, and then keeps asking for commands. After each command is run, it returns the output to the Rust program. The Rust web server is very simple. It has three endpoints, register, next, command complete, or CMD complete. When the turtle is activated, it first registers. Then the turtle loops over the following indefinitely. Query a command using the next endpoint, then execute that command, post the result to the command complete endpoint, and repeat. Here's the Lua script, it does exactly that. To give a little more detail about how the Rust program handles running multiple programs on different turtles, I've shown you the endpoints that run on the web server. These let us communicate with the turtle, however, that doesn't actually let us communicate within the Rust program. To do this, when the turtle, turtle registers, we create two multiple producer single consumer channels, a pair. We have at least as many pairs of channels as we do turtles. One channel is for sending strings. These strings are consumed by the next endpoint. They contain the next command for the turtle as well. This is literally just a string which the Lua program evaluates. The other channel is for sending a turt response. The turt response is re returned by the turtle after running a command. This contains details about whether it was a failure or success with some additional data such as a JSON. The advantage of using channels is that they naturally pause and resume the program based on when the turtle makes and completes the request. There are a few core libraries for the turtle, turt control, turt navigation, and turt inventory. Turt control makes for a clean way to interact with the most commonly used functions. These can be movement functions or inventory management or anything that controls the turtle. Turt navigation gives access to functions such as go to, which allows us to go to an exact position in the world, given any x, y, and z coordinate. Turt inventory, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. The first program that I ran using this architecture was the chunk digger, a very simple program that efficiently excavates huge areas. Each turtle can mine three Y layers at once, forward, above, and below. After clearing the first three layers, it will turn and continue onto the next three layers up. It does that using this big old match statement. The turtles will check their inventory periodically and dump it in a chest that must be placed by the player. This inventory management is pretty crude and has a lot of room for improvement. Getting this part running was a great feeling. It was easy to gather 60k blocks within a few hours um, using this script and eight turtles. By the way, we also have a chunk loader mod in this world, which means we can go and do other things whilst the turtles mine away. 3D models. I wanted to be able to import a 3D model and have an army of turtles build it. 
The OBJ file format is pretty common and supports textures. I'll talk about this more at the end. An OBJ file basically gives you a bunch of vert vertices and it also specifies what vertices are used to create a face. Vector library. My experience working with vectors and 3D math is quite limited. I decided to write a basic vector library from scratch in order to A, learn the basics, and B, gain an understanding of what code is run when you actually decide to use a math function. A voxel is a point in space that doesn't have any explicit coordinate. In my case, a voxel is represented by a value in a three-dimensional array. This three-dimensional array corresponds to literal block positions. To convert a face, which is a set of three vertices to its corresponding voxel, we need to do a couple of things. First, we can represent this point P as weight 1 times A to B plus weight 2 times A to C. Then we can check if point P even sits within the bounds of that plane by checking if either weight is greater than 0 and that the sum of the weights is less than or equal to 1. If that's true, then it sits within the place. I'll link a video which explains this topic perfectly. Using this method, it is fast and cheap to iterate over the x, y, x and y coordinates of the face. If point P in the x, x and y is on the face, we go ahead and calculate the z component using the normal of the face or plane and the corresponding x and y. We do have to do a check to see if the z component of the normal is zero. If so, we iterate over the z bounds of the face. This method ended up giving me some very sparse objects, and it turns out that there were a lot of rounding errors happening. I also believe that the faces were far smaller than a single unit, i.e. the xy iteration of the loop, meaning that whole faces would be excluded from the voxel array. To fix this, we can increase the resolution, which literally means we're iterating more times. That's barely noticeable though, since it's simple math, and it's only really done once. Converting to points. Now we can convert the voxel array to points. When I say a point, I mean an explicit coordinate in 2D or 3D space. It didn't make sense to try and maintain points in the previous step, as a voxel array gives constant access and insert time. To prevent duplicates using points rather than voxels, it would require a linear check through all the elements. Dividing work between turtles. Given some k number of turtles, how can we divide the workload between each turtle? I decided to go with k clusterings for this. k clusterings is a statistical method of grouping points. Initially, I started by grouping points in each uh, dimension, so the x, y, and z. However, since there can easily be like 50,000 plus points in a model, k means was running far too slowly. As a crude optimization, I took the total number of blocks for every y level, given an x, z coordinate. This means that the current implementation doesn't actually consider the y component of blocks and divides the points without respect to the height dimension. Each texture in this Unity world corresponds to a turtle in Minecraft. I would quickly like to add that there are a few functions that export the voxel array as blocks for use in Unity. Unity just keeps reading the JSON until the file size change is detected. Then it updates the scene. The FPS is horrific, but it's more for debugging purposes. Pathfinding. Now, at this point, each turtle has the following data, a list of points each specifying the location and type of block that must be placed. From the previous steps, the Y layers are still separate. So for each Y level, we have a list of blocks with an X and Z coordinate. This means we basically have the traveling salesman problem, which uh, is where you need to find the cheapest path through all the nodes and po or points in this case, without visiting the same place twice. If you've come across this problem before, you may be aware that this is NP hard, which is to say that for an input greater than 20, it's very, very difficult to compute. My first solution was to ignore the continuity of a level in full and instead use a search algorithm. The search algorithm was more or less obsolete, however. Um, this is because our goal was actually the nearest node since we weren't trying to find the cheapest path through a set of nodes. Essentially, this results in either running BFS when using the voxel array or a linear check through all of the remaining points to find the next closest destination. Minimum spanning trees try to connect all of the vertices without a cycle with the minimum overall cost. Using Kruskal's algorithm, this can be done very fast. It also doesn't use too much memory. The result of this algorithm is a tree which doesn't actually give an explicit path. 
To turn the MST into multiple paths, we can run DFS and order by scene times. Then when iterating through the nodes in order of scene times, we check if the previous node is equal to the current scene time minus one. If so, we add it to the current path. Otherwise, we complete the current path and start a new one. To combine multiple paths from the previous step into one big long one, we find the closest beginning of a path and add all of those points. From there, we repeat until all of the points have been added to the final path. Now, MSTs are certainly not a perfect solution to the traveling salesman problem. Another way of getting pretty close to the final solution is using genetic algorithms. Here, you have a population and carry forward the best performing genes using crossovers and mutations. The genetic algorithm takes quite a while to converge, so I set the starting state of the population to this MST. This immediately had the population average distance converge to only 10 units above the MST solution. Previously, the total GA distance would be twice that of the MST. After running the GA for over 200 iterations, there would usually be a decrease in distance of a few units. However, this wasn't worth the additional computational cost, so I decided not to go with the GA for the final solution. Now, at this point, we first convert a 3D OBJ model to a voxel array. Then we convert a voxel array to points. Thirdly, we perform k-means to divide the work between turtles. And finally, for each layer in the resulting data, a turtle can create an MST, perform DFS to get multiple paths, and combine those paths into one for execution. I'd like to talk about a few things that I would choose to add next. Please note that as of making this video, I do not intend to do any of this. I don't have the time. OBJs support material files and textures. The material files aren't actually that important, I think. This is because you need to use something like WGPU in Rust or OpenGL to render it. Instead, if you take the textures, like a PNG, that can be bundled with an OBJ, the OBJ will have points that map each face to a set of 2D points on the texture. You could then download a Minecraft texture pack, vanilla or whatever texture pack you're using, and calculate the distance between the texture of each face and the Minecraft textures. To prevent a massive refactor, I use the block type everywhere, which is an integer. This could correspond to the index of an array which specifies a texture or block to use. A major inefficiency of this program is that every turtle does the model passing, preparation, and k-mins. This means two things. A. The program uses way more memory than it should, since every turtle is storing every other turtle's blocks in addition to its own. And B. The steps mentioned are the most expensive part of the program. It should only be done once for a job. The passing might take 20 seconds, but the building takes up to 6 hours. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not that bad, just pointless. Personally, I would implement a Postgres database that stores jobs. Assigned to a job are multiple turtles. Each turtle has a set of blocks which it must place. If a turtle disconnects or joins, it simply checks the database to see what it should do. This brings me nicely onto the final feature, a web UI. Recompiling the program on every little change, even having to modify the source code, is a horrific solution for anything that gets used regularly. For me, it's perfect since I'm constantly text testing, fixing, and changing stuff, but seriously, a web UI attached to a database where you have jobs, you can assign multiple turtles to a job and track the positions and progress of every turtle in real time? That would be sick. Inefficiencies. I'll list these briefly since I believe that these would naturally get overhauled and fixed by implementing some of the above features. Repeated heavy computation on turtle joins, the database would fix that. Better progress saves. Progress saves are done using a file locally. This prevents thrashing the database and um, causing read-write locks. Currently, progress is saved at every Y level. Maybe this could be done for every Y level and a corresponding point. Refuel warning and action. Currently, turtles will stop wherever they are, possibly 200 blocks high if they run out of fuel there. Inventory management. The chunk digger's inventory management is very basic, and the builder is a little more advanced, but still not incredible. K-means doesn't consider the Y component. Finally, I'd like to tell you about the Minecraft world you've been seeing clips of. My flatmates and friends, Adam and Henry, both show an enjoyment for Minecraft. Henry set up his old school laptop as a home server. It's running Debian along with some web servers, Discord bots, and the Minecraft server. We use the following mods for Minecraft. 
His Create Farms also enabled the massive turtle projects, producing charcoal for fuel and providing the trains to ferry huge amounts of resources. The potato gun is also pretty OP. Adam set up an iron farm along with the villager trading area. They supplied insane tools and access to an endless supply of enderpearls, used in the ender modems on the turtles. He also produced the music you heard in this video, so a big thanks for that. This project took about a month and is coming to a close, for now.